Okay, brothers and sisters, New Testament scholars, greetings to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am here in Alabama leading a revival. God is blessing, really having um, an awesome time just in wow and all of seeing what God is doing. But I miss you guys and certainly um, as promised I want to continue our lectures through the Gospel of John using the technology available to us. If you were to see what I had set up here now it would um, it would be very confusing to you and I would admit that it's somewhat confusing to me so hopefully it will work out okay but anyway on the screen you'll see the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation and we finished uh, in uh, last time we met uh, discussing the purpose of 1st John and according to uh, our textbook the the, the authors uh, they they discuss that uh, or they assert that the primary purpose of first John is to give a certainty of faith that scripture text reads as follows first John 5 13 these things I have written to you who believe in the name of of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So this looks like that the readers of John's epistle uh, had some uh, contradictions that may have that they may have been uh, trying to process, or the false teachers that were mentioned earlier in the letter may have caused some doubt about the believer's salvation based on their teachings and John wanted to assure them that their faith is based upon the reliability of what John saw him being an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ all those things that he did on behalf of their salvation but also he wanted to 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 strengthen their confidence in the Word of God I mean if we can't have confidence in the Word of God what can we have confidence in right so so this is uh, where John is taken he, he wants to give them a certainty of the faith so these three purposes are listed on the screen are certainly from the letter itself and um, and I would agree with the authors of our textbook that first uh, John 5 13 would be a primary purpose the other purposes mentioned here um, in, in some way they they hinge on that primary purpose in first John 5 and 13 okay so I uh, haven't said all that we'll uh, move on okay so now to the letter itself all right it begins with the prologue in verses 1 through 4 This is where John says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with this son Jesus Christ and of course he this is one of the purposes that he mentions in verse 4 and these things we write to you that your joy may be full so John is writing from the perspective of an eyewitness okay I went the wrong way there sorry about that let me go the other way with my slide presentation so here we are okay that which was from the beginning um, again the Greek there um, he's, uh, as I've mentioned before in class I've uh, taught this class on the master's level so uh, the notes there would have the Greek letters uh, in which you would not likely be able to read but um, in a way just trust me that that is the Greek uh, rendering of of the English translation okay uh, but um, 
the fact that there is no definite article um, that speaks of um, of any beginning. Okay, so in other words, he's not re referring to uh, in our English translations. It, it would say that which was, which was from the beginning, right? But John here, um, in the original language, there is no definite article. So therefore, uh, it could literally read that which was from beginning. You know, see the the there in your English in your Bible translation would likely be italicized like it is in mine, indicating that. Uh, that it's what's inserted by the translators, all right? So, so really, he's talking about a beginning that really is, um, it's not really a definite point in time. It's just a beginning, okay? Um, likely a timeless eternity, okay? Jesus is timeless. If you go back to the beginning of of John, uh, John's Gospel, John chapter one, um, you can turn there in your Bibles if you have it handy. But uh, he says there that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He says later on, he says, and the word became flesh later on in that chapter, I think verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Truth. So clearly he is talking about Jesus Christ and he was he's referring to the eternality of Christ. He, he always was. Uh, yes, his incarnation had a beginning uh, when God through Christ uh, entered time and space. He began uh, his, his uh, incarnational ministry. But here he's talking about that timeless eternity. OK. That which was from the beginning. Okay, sorry for the red line there. Let me get that out of the way because that's a little distracting. Okay, real time with the technology here, so appreciate your um, and why we may have to. There we go. All right. Well, I tell you what, it's not quite coming out the way I expect it to there. But that's okay. We're going to go on. All right. So, um, so the next point here. Okay. All right. So the verbs have heard, have seen, they're in what's called a perfect tense. And uh, we don't really have, um, it's kind of hard in the English language to really uh, reflect that, uh, the perfect tense in the Greek. But bottom line, it means something that occurs in the past with abiding results up to the present time. For instance, uh, you say you graduated high school. Okay, that graduated, okay, you, we may in our language refer to that as a past tense. But in the Greek, it could be a perfect tense because you graduated high school and the diploma that you earned it still has abiding results. You're still a high school graduate up to this up to this time. So this this ver these verbs here have seen and have heard means that John saw and heard Jesus Christ. He he witnessed him with his senses, with his physical senses, like the eyes, uh, the vision, the sight, with the ears, uh, the acoustic uh, of his uh, of his physical. Um, um, regimen there and uh, but that changed him John what John heard and saw had an effect on his life now on moving on uh, in um, verse 4 John says he wrote for the sake of their fellowship that's from the word koinonia and uh, it has an interesting uh, meaning now when we talk about fellowship in our churches it, it's oftentimes having to do with some kind of uh, meal <laughs> that we share, right? You know, as good Baptists, we love food. And, uh, and so fellowship oftentimes involves a meal that people share together. However, I would, um, um, from my observations, sometimes the meals uh, just becomes means for people to eat and maybe have a conversation with someone around. But the purpose of the meal is that people would have, they would share, they would share life with each other. They would talk, they would, they would, um, they would really um, 
uh, talk about uh, the uh, the issues of their lives. They would uh, inquire of another person um, some details of their life, learn some things they they did not know beforehand. And so um, that's what the fellowship is all about. It's really a, a it's the supernatural life that Christians share. That's a definition that Barker gave in the uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary. I like that definition, by the way. It's the supernatural life that Christians share. So that's what we have. It's something that the world really can't relate to. We share a supernatural life by our faith in Christ and being a part of the family of faith. All right. So we share something very valuable, very precious the supernatural life. Okay, so moving on. Verses 5 through 10 is uh, walking in the light. I won't read all of these uh, verses, and so I have to give credit to the incomparable Dr. David Shackelford for his outline. Um, I uh, could not improve upon it, so I'm uh, going to go with what he has. Um, so, in these verses 5 through 10, he, he gives some contention, conditional sentences that examine whether the believer is truly walking in the light. It says in verse 5, this is the message that which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He goes further to say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if you look at verses 8, 9, and 10, they each start with that conditional word phrase there, if. Okay, so these are conditional sentences. And so uh, the first is our examination um, or the examination of our fellowship with God. And secondly, the examination of our fellowship with other Christians and the examination of our fault as Christians and the examination of our faithfulness to our confession. Okay, so he first begins with our fellowship with God. Okay. You know, our relationship with God is important and We want to be mindful that walking with God is walking in the light. You have this dichotomy here that John uh, often alludes to. He does it in his gospel, uh, the, that dichotomy between light and darkness. When he, talk, when he says walking in darkness, now if I were in class, I would ask you, well, what does walking in darkness mean? And then you would give me some very intelligent and insightful answers. But since we're not in class, I'll have to kind of put that question to you and just think about that. What does what does walking in darkness mean? Well, I think quite obviously it means walking in sin. Sin is darkness. That is a life that is not uh, not reflective of 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 the of walking in the spirit. Okay. Uh, you can't we can't walk with God and walk in sin. It just uh that just can't be. That's a contradiction in terms. All right. So um to walk in fellowship with God is to walk in the truth. All right. Um, then he goes further and say, well, if if we walk in the light, and He is in the light, okay, we have fellowship with one another. In other words, if we're walking truly with God in the right way, we'll have that fellowship with other Christians. Could it be? Could it be that the reason our relationship with other Christians is strained? Is that, or it's because our walk with God is not what it should be? If we're walking with God, if we're relating to God in the right way, if we're right with God, we'll be right with other people. And vice versa. If we're not right with our brother or sister in Christ, we're not right with God. So so it all it all really works in there together, okay? Also examine our, our fault with Christians. Now, this is where we need to be genuine and and transparent before the Lord. Okay. Sin has so pervaded uh, our being, who we are, 
that um, is there, right? God, we're cleansed positionally by the blood of Jesus Christ from sin, and we're justified, seen by God as one who has never sinned. However, the reality, there's a reality that sin still exists in us. It still has, uh, is in the recesses of, of our being, okay? And uh, until we're glorified, we will do battle with sin. And so we need to be honest about that. We, we don't need to take the position that we're sinless. Practically speaking, okay? We're sinless um, as far as our, uh, in the sight of God, okay? So um, so our, our, our fault is Christian. So we need to, to examine ourselves and uh, when the, the Lord Reveal sin. We need to uh, be honest in that. Examine uh, of our faithfulness to our confession. Um, confession is a very interesting word. There, that is the word. Okay, let me go to a different screen here. Okay, it is the Greek word for which we get, uh, which we would transliterate, homo le. Gay. Oh. Okay. And it comes from two words, homo and legeo. Okay, homo means same. Legeo means to speak or to say. So what that means is that we need to say the same thing. that God says about our sin, okay? Say the same thing that, that God says about our sin. In other words, agree with God, okay? The word of God says that pride is a sin. Who are we to say, well, you know, can pride really be um, a sinful thing? Okay. If the word of God says that lust is a sin, although the world may have a different value system there, we have to say the same thing that God says. So we have to confess. That means to say the same thing that God says about our sin. Okay. Very powerful word there. All right. That confession. Examination of his faithfulness to our confession. So if we confess it, if we go before the Lord and agree with him, that's what God blesses. You know, it's like uh, if you know someone is is misleading you, let's say if someone, if they were, were telling you a lie, right? Someone, you saw someone um, hit your car and you go and confront them and you say, look, you hit my car. And they say, no, I didn't. I didn't hit your car. He says, yes, you did. I saw you. You hit my car. And they would deny it again. No, I, I didn't hit your car. I mean, you would become incensed, insulted that they would lie to you when you know that they offended you in this way. They hit your car. Now, if they would just say, well, okay, you're right. I hit your car and I'm sorry. I think most of us, most, <laughs> would not be as angry at the situation or the person, right? Because they, they're, they're greed. You, you saw them, you have proof and, and, and they would not, um, they would not lie to you or they would not, um, front you this way. So I believe the same, some of the way with God, we don't want to kind of call God a liar to his face to say, well, you know, whatever's a sin is not sin because I have a value system different than yours. So we gotta be very, very careful about that. All right. Some powerful truth there. And of course, the examination of the fallacy of any claim to sinlessness. So I already talked about that. So it's a fallacy to say that we have no sin. Okay. All right. Now, man, I'm moving slower in these slides than I am in class. But uh, it's the way it goes, right? With the word of God. I'm going to move on once I get my pen here. Okay. Christians and sin. 
All right. So just some questions here that, again, if we were in class together, we would be able to discuss this with each other. But uh, you know, the question can come up is, can a Christian sin? And the answer to that, obviously, is what? Yes, Christians do sin. Christians commit sins and unbelievers commit. Christians sin. Christians lie, steal, murder, commit immoral sexual sin, prideful, abusive, all those things. Christians do those things. And so then that would prompt another question as well. If a Christian can sin, can he or she lose their salvation? And there are some of the more Arminian um, beliefs that a Christian can lose their salvation if they sin. Well, I would say certainly not. I've said it before. I believe in eternal security. We're not saved based on whether we sin or don't sin. We're clearly our sinners. And, and, and But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses of us of our sin, past, present, and future. Okay? It covers sin that we have committed, that we are yet committing, and that we will commit. Okay? Everlasting life, right, is not temporary. Think about that. Eternal life begins the moment we, we accept Christ. But, you know, if it were to be removed, it would no longer be eternal life. Right. All right. Also, um, consider from John, going back to John's gospel, he he uh, talks about there that um, I'm going to turn there in my Bible. As you can see, I have a, a Bible with pages. I like to hear pages turn. In John's Gospel, chapter 10, where he is um, discussing the motif of the Good Shepherd. But he says that in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That word never perish there is in the original language to say double negative, right? You know, we're taught in English to you don't use double negatives, right? But Greek does because it emphasizes a meaning that never ever. OK, so anyway, just uh, take take the Bible's word for it. Um, God has even saved us from our worst enemy, which is ourselves. OK. You've heard that saying that the enemy enemy uh, is oftentimes the inner me, right? <laughs> so if if we're in the hands of the Lord and nobody can snatch us out of his hand, well, we can't jump out either. OK, yes, God gives us free will, but he has us when we're genuinely saved. God's got us, and I thank God that he does, because if I could lose my salvation, I would. I think you would also, okay? All right, Christians and sin continued. So another question. If a Christian can sin, and it does not cause him or her to lose their salvation, does it really matter if one sins or not? So the question goes to you. Of course, the answer is there already given. Yes, it does. Yes, it matters. Okay. Why does it matter? Okay. Well, because sin does lead to death. Okay. Sin does lead to death. If we say we have no sin, that's in the present tense. That means denying that we have sin deceives ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay. So we have to acknowledge that sin is still. Still hanging around, like Paul says in Romans 8, man, it's like that body of death we carry, carry around, has that stench and just kind of weighs us down. But 
but there's blessings that God gives us. You know, sin does lead to death, and, and while not, uh, it can lead to physical death, but man, that's that's death of other things that we can uh, forfeit, that we can experience as well, rather like death of, of our joy, death of our peace, death of our relationship with God, death of our ministries, death of our influence for Christ, also loss of reward. So sin can destroy a lot of things, and we would not... Uh, be faithful Christians if we neglected to uh, what be as godly as as we as God has given us the grace to be. So, so therefore, sin deceives and it destroys. Okay, so yes, it does matter if we sin. Okay, if a person if a person is saved, um, I, I remember what Dr. Adrian Rogers said about this. He says that. He says a, a Christian sins all that they want to. He says, but the point of it is they don't want to. <laughs> and I think that's true. And that if we um, are born again believers, truly born again, okay, we really don't want to sin. We don't want to. We do. Again, read Romans chapter 7. Okay, Paul talks about the things that he would he does not do and the things that he would not do, those things he does. Okay. And that's what we find ourselves doing time and time again. Okay. But again, we don't we don't want to, right? We we want to God to take us, free us from all of that sin. Okay. Because sin causes so much damage to our lives. Okay. All right, let us move on. Sin must be dealt with. Okay, I'm gonna move through this a little faster here. Confession different than admission. So I talked about that agreeing with God about our sin. Okay, homologeo. That was the Greek word that I discussed earlier. Okay, literally to say the same thing. So I kind of jumped ahead of myself there, but that's all good. All right. See sin the way God sees it. Confess continually, right? Completely and confidently. Okay, confess that sin continually. All right. Completely, be honest with God, right? And I would even, I would even say that we don't pray and say, "Well, God, forgive me of all of my sin." And we can do that; that's good. But it's better if we were to call that sin out. Just be complete, God. I, I've had dishonest thoughts today. I, I Lord, I had anger against my brother or sister. You know, Jesus in Matthew five equated angry thoughts with a, against a brother or sister as murder. Okay. Be honest with God. Uh, perhaps there's been some lust. Okay. Looking at someone in a way that clearly is is, um, is a sinful. Um, perhaps even envy, right? You're seeing someone and um, they have a new outfit that you know that that should be yours and not theirs. Okay. Confess that sin to the Lord, okay? Uh, be specific. Confidently, God is faithful, okay? God is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, you know, go in confidence. Go boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need, all right? Let's move on. The assurance of being in the light. So this is chapters two through three. So we're going to pick up some speed here. Um, in chapter two, there are three tests of assurance. You'll need to know these. Okay. Chapter two, verses two through six. There is the test of obedience. Then we have the test of love, verses seven through eleven. And then we have the test of faith, verses 18 through 27. Notice in chapter 2, verse 1, John refers to his readers as my little children. John clearly had a, um, a very close relationship with his readers likely as a pastor or some kind of shepherding um, role he 
uh, served them. He he loved them, and uh, and I've said this before. We we need to um, serve from a posture of love for the people whom God has entrusted us. Okay, so uh, John provides an example of this. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. You know, I like to believe that chapter two, verse one, really really connects with the previous verses. I, I really that's one of those uh, places in the Bible where I re regret the chapter break because I believe it's really connected with. Uh, the previous verses about confessing sin because we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous and so where we where we where we kind of land as unrighteous we have an advocate who is righteous Jesus Christ the Father right test of obedience okay two through six and so he himself is a propitiation for our sins what is propitiation oh man big word there right propitiation what's that mean okay well of course if you've taken uh, theology course uh, you'll uh, you will have studied this before but but really it, it talks about um, it's an atoning sacrifice Paul uses this word in Romans chapter 3 I'm going to turn there and read it It'd be good for you to do it as well In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, he talks about Jesus Christ here, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Okay? So, that is an atoning sacrifice, more of a, uh, a satisfaction, okay, an idea that. Um, the requirement for sin, the price that needed to be paid, has been satisfied. The righteous demands of God has been satisfied through Jesus Christ. Okay, so again, that word propitiation, a very big word, but um, we want to make sure that we understand what they mean. So, so Christ is that atoning sacrifice. That covering is another word that's being used there, right? So, bottom line is he, he, uh, he has died in our place and we we have um, we have redemption through his blood okay. so the test of obedience what's that test right uh, verse 6 he he who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked okay so that's the test of obedience also the test of love if we love God we ought to love our brother or sister Right. Look at verse nine. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Contradiction in terms to say we love God, but hate. Our brother. Or sister. OK. All right, I'm going to move on here. Test of faith, okay? Verses 18 through 27. Okay. And so this is where, again, verse, uh, chap verse 18, he does, again, uh, refer to uh, his readers as little children, a term of endearment, clearly. And he refers to the Antichrist and that those who have departed from them the author of our textbook calls them successionists. That's a good way. But they were uh, these false teachers in the church and people who, who followed after them. They left. They left the church. And and this was damaging. Because these were like the people who uh, were close to other members of the church. Maybe they uh, had strong relationships with them. You know, families that may have gotten together regular on a regular basis to to talk about life and kids played with each other. All those kinds of things were likely um, happening here. And so when these people had yeah, this division, uh, people left. And so 
Uh, truth can divide. It just can. And um, But John had to address this. He says in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Okay. So, so they were not of, of the believers. They somehow, they, they had been, um, they had been wearing the mask. They had been acting the part, playing the role of the Christian, but um, they left. And what John is saying here is that there's something about um, persisting. Something about having some stick to itness that is characteristic of a true believer. Okay, so so those whom God has saved and filled with the Spirit, there's just something within that just won't let you walk away from the truth. Okay, Maybe that doesn't mean you're not tempted to do that. Okay, but but there is a sense of perseverance there. Okay, chapter three. Let me see if I can erase these things here. Still cannot. There we go. Got it. All right. Okay, so chapter three develops these tests of assurance. Okay. Uh, test of love, okay. Um, test what we love, fellow Christians, uh, and what we don't love, which is the world. Okay, Christians should love what God loves, which is truth, His people. Okay, should not love the world. So what not to love the world okay so love not the world love not the world is in the imperative the present and fair present imperative okay what that means is believers are admonished okay, to stop loving the world. Okay, that's back in chapter two, verse fifteen. Okay, it says, "Do not love the world." So Christians have fallen in love with the world, and man, I tell you, there there is an allurement that the world has on us all. And when we talk about the world, you know, we're talking about um, the material aspects of it, right? You know, things like, you know, wealth, uh, influence, power, okay, status go along with that and you know American Western Christianity I believe does not deal with this as as diligent as we should so so we have to deal with this uh, he's saying do not love the world Okay, we don't have that kind of relationship with the world, because really, you know, as Jesus taught in in Matthew chapter six, we we can't love God and mammon or wealth, money. Okay, we just we don't have that much love in us. <laughs> okay, we don't either love one or the other. Okay, and um, and so this is what John is saying right into these Christians who had fallen in love with the world, okay? World corrupts, okay? There is the three things. You'll need to know these three things, so if you're taking notes, you'll want to write those down, put a little star beside it, okay? 
how the world cor corrupt verse 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life and um, the lust of the flesh by doing the wrong things lust the lust of the eyes by desiring the wrong things and the pride of life determining to be numero uno okay. taking the position that you will ascend to the top somehow some way and whoever's in your way will get bulldozed or get stepped on clearly that is not the way of the born-again believer in Christ Christians should not love the world for three reasons its character its corruption and its condemnation okay the world has nothing for the believer okay and think about it okay? we're not going to be here very long <laughs> uh, why would we put our love and and our affection toward that which is passing away okay so we shouldn't love the world doesn't mean that we you know don't uh, work hard and and gain whatever God would bless us with financially or position influence platform but man that shouldn't be a love there right you know we should not love that that power we should not love that status okay? because a love of it means that uh, your heart will be there and um, and if your heart's there then you put everything into that and then it becomes an idol okay we got to do battles with idolatry okay those idols all right looks like I missed a little bit here but that's okay we'll we'll move on okay all right in chapter three we um, we have J John continuing to talk about love and uh, the love the father has has given to us in chapter three verse one that we should be called children of God and again he refers to that world that really does not know us because it does not know him so in the world we are really in a place where we don't belong and, and we're strange to it and John is saying that's okay verse chapter 3 verse 3 a scripture verse I I really love there it says and everyone who has this hope in him purif purifies himself just as he is pure so there's there's a pursuit there's a pursuit of holiness okay so we um, having that hope of seeing the Lord we purify ourselves okay well, let's move on the examination of truth faith so we're going to jump on to chapter 4 okay signs of genuine faith the ability to discern error beloved do not believe every spirit But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the test for true doctrine is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. The Word of God, the Bible, is the key to good theology. The Word of God, right? Biblical theology. I like biblical theology better than systematic theology. Of course, systematic is good. You know, that where you take the Bible and you take topics... It's more of a topical study of the Bible, really, you know, studying studying the doctrine of God, of man, of Christ, uh, of sin, and so forth. Uh, but biblical theology just takes the Bible and and what does it teach about God, right? And and you follow the biblical uh, pattern there. Okay, but both are helpful for us in becoming um, well-rounded in the Scriptures. Okay, all right. Uh, the social test of love, third time in this letter. Okay, a love is a nature of God. He says in verse eight.
for love let us love one another for love is of god and everyone who loves is born of god and knows god in, in uh, verse 8 he who does not love does not know god for god is love verse 10 and this is love not that we love god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins So Christ's death is demonstrated the love of God. Okay. So <clears throat> if we love God, we will love our brothers and sisters. Simple as that. Jesus, Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. Okay. So we cannot love a God we have not seen we don't love a brother or sister who we do see it's a very powerful logic there okay so the demonstration of faith so we had the examination of true faith now we have the demonstration of faith of true faith and verses 1 through 21 we'll go ahead and finish this out here the uh, video is getting a bit long so um, we'll, we'll try to finish up the uh, we will finish up here Okay, here we go. Um, so, loves God and keeps his commandment. Okay? And has victory over the world. And the assurance of salvation. He loves God. I like what he says there. That whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God verse 3 that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome not burdensome man how we misrepresent God when we believe that uh, living the godly life the life that God has laid out for us in the scriptures that he, the precepts those those principles it's not burdensome <laughs> Uh, is not restricting, as the world would say, is actually quite liberating. The peace you have when you, you know, you haven't stolen anything, right? You don't have to worry about getting um, in trouble with the law. If you're not told a lie, you're not having to worry about somebody discovering uh, you covering up a lie. Um, sexual sin, right? How damaging that can be, right? So, when you appear in that way, it just frees you up. Peace. Victory over the world, right? Because the world doesn't have uh, doesn't have you in its grips. And of course, there's the assurance of salvation. Okay. John, First uh, John five and thirteen, man, would be a really good script, scripture memory verse for you. Okay. These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe. In the name of the Son of God. Okay, the assurance of salvation. Of course, there's victory in prayer. In verses 14 through 17. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay. Okay. Victory over sin. If you have victory in prayer, you have you will have victory over sin. <laughs> okay, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now, what this means here, it really does not. It really does not mean that the Christian will never sin. It's not what it's saying. But what it's saying is there will not be a practice. Okay, an intentional a practice, um, a persistence in an unrepentant way. Okay, that's what it means. Okay. You won't continually be in, in that muck and mire.
All right, so that is First John. I do not have the contributions to the canon on the slide there. I intended to do that, but I don't have it. So forgive me for that. But we just gotta ha we gotta have that, right? We gotta talk about that. But I'll um I'll put it on the slides in in the next lecture. I'll talk about it. Okay. But uh, it's Jesus Christ as a propitiation for the sins of the entire world. That's the first contribution, okay? It's in your textbook. Um, mine's on not page 1924. But it's Jesus Christ as the propitiation for the sins of the entire world, right? Propitiation. Okay. We've talked about that word propitiation already. Okay, and what it means, okay, that is a, a covering and atoning sacrifice for sins. Okay. All right. And secondly, God is love. Second contribution to the canon describes the loving nature of God. Okay, so I'll tell you what, here's what I'll do. Okay, okay. so contributions. Kind of different writing on this screen, but anyway, just bear with me if you will. I'll write it as good as, good as I can. Okay, Jesus Christ. The propitiation, propitiation, sorry about that, for our sins. Okay, number two, okay. God is love. Okay, and of course, going back to the first bullet, this will come from 1 John 2 2, and this will come from 1 John 4, 16, okay? But make sure you understand the propitiation, okay? That will be important, all right? And um, we will, um, good doctrine there, okay? And of course, uh, the third contribution is Christian assurance, okay? As you know from my test, I'll, I will ask you to, to, to name these contributions, okay? All right. These are the contributions from 1 John. All right. Having said all that, we will uh, <clears throat> we will end uh, the study of, of 1 John, okay? And we'll pick up with 2 and 3 John next. We'll, I'll have a one-slide presentation for that. So we're kind of long. Wow, 53 minutes. So sorry about that, okay? But... Um, in a way, I, want, I wanted to keep it to under 50 minutes, um, but uh, in a way, um, we've gotten through it. So, um, again, my apologies for the background noise. I'm in a hotel room and the, all the noise around me. So, um, in a way, this will uh, end the uh, lecture for uh, First John, and um, pray that you have a great and wonderful and outstanding day in the Lord. Talk to you later. God bless.